everyone. Thanks so much for joining with us online today. We're so glad that you're here. And although you may not be with us in our building physically, we still consider you to be a big part of what we're doing here at Rhythm Church. If you'd like to take a next step in your faith journey, I encourage you to text the word next to the number on the screen. We'd love to assist you in taking your next step in your faith journey. I'd also encourage you not to just consume our content, but contribute to it. If you'd like to give to us financially, you can go to rhythmchurch.org slash give, and it's a safe and secure way that you can give right there, as we do our best to help people find and follow the real Jesus. Well, good morning and welcome to Rhythm Church today. I want to welcome you and also those of you that are watching online. We're glad that you're here too. I know many of you will be watching this later, so thanks for joining in with us as well. And I also want to encourage you, if you've downloaded our mobile app, you can always follow along with our sermon notes. If you just clicked on media, Sunday service, there'll be some sermon notes there. You can follow along. There's some fill in the blank stuff, so feel free to do that. If you're on your phone, that's okay. We'll know why, because you're using our church app. It's awesome. So thanks for being here today. As Curtis mentioned, we're in week three of our series called Jonah, and if you've missed the last couple weeks, I want to recap a little bit what we talked about. So there's this prophet named Jonah. Jonah has been disobedient to God. God calls Jonah to go preach against the city of Nineveh, and if we talked about in the first week, Nineveh is not a good place. In fact, describing how awful the Ninevites were would take me uh, a long time, and it would be very disgusting and horrific in many ways to talk about some of the things that the Ninevites did. And so Jonah was like, nope, I'm not going there. Don't care for those people. Not going to happen. So instead of hopping on a camel and going to Nineveh, he hops on a ship, goes the opposite direction to Tarshish. And so he's on his way there. He's on the ship. A storm comes, and then the ship is about to break, and so finally he's like, hey, it's my fault. Throw me overboard. Well, all the other sailors are reluctant, but they're like, okay, we'll throw you overboard. And so they throw Jonah overboard, and sure enough, the storm goes away. But then Scripture says that the Lord provided a fish, swallowed Jonah whole. So he's in the belly of a fish for three days, and last week what we talked about was this prayer. What we talked about last week was that whether you're at the height of the mountaintop or the depths of the belly of a fish, when you cry out to God, he hears you. So that's kind of what we've talked about so far in this story. And so the last verse we read last week was when this fish, Scripture says, vomits Jonah up onto the shore. And today we're going to see, I think, one of the most beautiful pictures of grace that we see in all of the scriptures. The grace of God, especially to those who don't deserve it. If you brought a Bible, I'm going to ask you to turn to Jonah chapter 3. If you don't have a Bible, that's okay. We can follow along on the screens. And then again, if you're watching online, feel free to follow along on the screens as well. Jonah chapter 3, we're going to start in verse 1. Scripture says this. It says, The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Now, I want you to make note of that, circle it, highlight it, whatever you need to do, the phrase, a second time. In Hebrew, if you're curious, this one word is shani. The word of the Lord came to Jonah shani, a second time. It means again, came to him shani. The one who didn't deserve it, yet got it anyway. A second chance he got from God. A lot of people that I know don't really like to give second chances. We have this attitude of, well, if you wrong me in any way, I'm done with you. You're cut off. You're dead to me. Yet we serve a God who continually gives second chances. He came to Jonah, a shani, a second time he came to him. I can't tell you how many times in my life God has came to me again. More times than I care to admit, God has come back to me 
again, even when I don't deserve it. I think God might be coming back to some of you today. A shani, a, a second time. Maybe some of you that are here today, you've been running. And God wants to come to you again. Others of you, maybe like Jonah, you've been in fellowship with God, but you've been disobedient. In the last chapter, Jonah said, what I have vowed, I will make good. And today, some of you might be able to say the same thing. What I have vowed, I will make good. Maybe some of you will return back to God today. The shani, a second chance. Maybe some of you here today will experience the same grace that Jonah experienced. And I kind of like to think about it like this. I don't know if you've ever seen one of these before. Etch a sketch. I don't know how you were when you were a child or maybe an adult. If you like to etch a sketch, that's cool. But whenever you use the etch a sketch, you know, you try so hard to maneuver and wiggle your way around to make something beautiful. And I think that's so reflective of our life. We try so hard to twist the dials and try to make something beautiful of our life. Yet, I don't know, maybe some of you are skilled etch a sketch artists. I don't know. But Oftentimes, what I created was a big mess. But the cool thing about God is you just pick that thing up and you just shake it and it all goes away. It's a grace of God in our life. It's a clean slate. You get to start over. You get to do, do it all over again. Try again. Start twisting those dials another time. Maybe some of you will experience that kind of grace today. He gives second chances, clears the slate. The word of God will come to you a shine, a second time. Let's keep reading verse 2. God says, go to the great city of Nineveh. Notice he says, great city of Nineveh. And proclaim to it the message I give you. Now I want to talk about the word go here first because it actually comes from two Hebrew words. It's the word kum and yalak. Kum and yalak. Together it means go now. Not go when you feel like it or maybe go when you get all things sorted out or go whenever you're ready. No, go now. Go urgently. Go suddenly. Whenever God comes to you a second time and maybe he's, he's calling you to do something, maybe he wants you to step out, maybe he wants you to give him another chance, maybe he wants you to try something you've never tried before, and he comes back to you a second time, he's saying, go now. Go now. Maybe there's some of you here today that when you listen to the Spirit of God, you recognize that you need to do something. Maybe reach out to somebody. Maybe apologize to somebody. Maybe give something away. Maybe repent of some sin or to make something right. Queem yalak, kum yalak, go now, do it immediately. Don't let, the, the scripture says this, don't let the sun go down on your anger. Do it now, go now. He says, pick up everything and go to the city of Nineveh and proclaim the message that I give to you. I want us to notice something else here. If you, when we're reading it, I made note that it says the great city of Nineveh. Well, we've talked about how awful Nineveh is, so why would God call it the great city? It's not really what you think. It's not a great city in terms of morality, but Nineveh was actually a great city in terms of influence. In fact, throughout history, you can go back and look that things in Nineveh that started were actually transforming the culture. It was an ancient population of about 120,000 people. It was kind of the cultural epicenter of that time. And again, historians, historians would argue that it was one of the most important historical cities as far as influencing others. It was surrounded by this seven and a half mile long fortress, these walls and and he's saying, go now to this city. It's great in influence, and that's why I want you to transform it. I want you to go there because the city's great, and what happens there can begin to change the culture. It's fascinating. 
If we keep reading in verse 3. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to go through it. Jonah finally obeys. He's been running. He obeys, and this city's big. It takes multiple days to go through it. So yes, kum yalak, immediately now he goes. He does it right away. He says, I'll speak. I'll, I'll, I'll share the good news. I'll, I'll tell the, the whole city about you, God. Whatever you want me to do, my answer is yes. And so oh, jo- Jonah obeys the word of the Lord. If we skip down to verse 4, Scripture says this. It says, Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming this. Forty more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. He's giving him a warning, saying, you have 40 days. The word here, began, it says Jonah began by going a day's journey. That word began is chalabau, which I'm terrible at Hebrew, so you just forgive me. But chalabau, in the Hebrew language, it means to untie or to loosen. And that's why I love looking at these words, because it gets at something that I think oftentimes we miss if we just read it in English. It says Jonah began by going a day's journey. We're thinking, oh, okay, he started. Cool. But if you look at what that word means in the Hebrew, it actually means to untie or to loosen. And so you can see the picture here. In order to go, Jonah had to loosen something. He had to untie something. He had to let something go. And I think the same is true of us. You're going to need to untie yourself, unravel yourself, maybe let go of something if you're going to do what God wants you to do. I don't know what that is for you. It's, it's maybe different for me than it is for you. Um, it could be that you're holding on to your self-will. Well, I'm going to do what I want to do no matter what. It could be that you're holding on to some financial security or control. Well, I can't take that job because it's just not secure enough for me. Maybe you're holding on to your reputation, what other people think of you. Well, if I do that, man, people are going to think I'm crazy. There's no way. What is it you might have to let go of? in order to be obedient to what God wants. But until you chala bow, until you let it go, you can never really advance the way God wants you to. And this is what Jonah does. He let go of something and he moved forward. He goes in to this city. And like verse 4 says, is he proclaimed, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overturned. Now again, we got to look at some specific words here because if you look at the word overturned in the Hebrew language, it's hippok. So in 40 days, you will be hippok. This word can either mean overturned or destroyed. It can be overturned or changed. It kind of has different meanings in the Hebrew language. It's kind of like bar in English. You can have a bar of soap. You can go to a bar. You can have a gold bar. It's like one of those things where it's used multiple ways. And so what he's saying here, it's either overturned or destroyed, either overturned or changed. So this prophetic message of God, 40 days and you'll either be destroyed or you'll be forever changed. What will it be? What will it be? Verse 5, I think, would be one of the most difficult verses for anyone living in this time period to believe. Verse 5 says this. The Ninevites believed God. The Ninevites believed God. Now notice, it, it doesn't say they believed Jonah. And I'm so glad it says that. They believed God. And this brings up a great point. You don't have to listen to me or Curtis, or a pastor that you listen to maybe online, or Christian radio, or whatever it is. You don't have to listen to that. But when God speaks, you should probably listen. So if we go back to the beginning, it says they believed 
God. And you have to understand as a somebody living in this time period, even, even today as we read this, they would have said, no way. There is no way the people of Nineveh believed God. There's no chance. It's like me saying that everyone in Hollywood has become a follower of Jesus. Or, hey, every casino in Vegas is now giving money to the poor. It's like the same thing. Like, there's no way that's happening. There's no chance. It's truly remarkable. Again, they would have been blown away by it. I think we should be too because they believed God. A culture and a people that were so awful and so caught up in violence and awful things believed God. Let's pick back up in verse 6. It says, when Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. This is the proclamation he issued in Nineveh. So some, something happened here. The ruler of this country, something's going on because you don't just take off your royal throws, put on a sackcloth, and get down in the dirt. And he issues this decree. He says, do not let people or animals, herds or flocks, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink, but let people and animals be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so he will not perish. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. Now this part's interesting. Because he issues this decree and everyone's fasting. No one's eating, not even the animals, he says. I don't want anyone to eat. And in your pain, in those hunger pains, I want us all to cry out to God. Again, there's that theme, even Jonah in the belly of a fish cries out to God. And we see again here the people of Nineveh in their violence and their evil and in their sin, they're still able to cry out to God and he hears them. Jonah comes out preaching to the Ninevites, the, the people who were furthest from God. And again, there may be some of you here today, you may be the furthest from God than you've ever felt in your life. You may be in a position where you're like, I haven't heard from God in ages. Just like the people of Nineveh, you may have been caught up in the cycle of sin and self-destruction and, and evil and, and violence, whatever it may be, and, and you may feel like there's no way God can hear me. Yet we see this here and we see it over and over again in scriptures that when the people of God cry out to him, he hears you. Then I can't promise you that what you want to happen is going to happen in your life, but I can promise you that God hears you. He sees you. He's with you. And all he really wants is obedience. Some of you here may think there's no way you'll ever come back to God. It's just not possible. But you know there's something going on inside of you that you still feel so close. And what's funny is sometimes those who appear to be the furthest from God are actually the ones who are the closest. And what I want to encourage you today is let your heart break again. Just allow your heart to break. The Ninevites repented. If you study through history, the, the repentance didn't last long. I mean, you, you can go back in history. The Ninevites kind of returned to their old ways. It didn't last very long. But there was a season in which they repented. There was a season in which they were shown grace in verse 1 of our text in Jonah, Jonah, God showed Jonah grace. In verse 10, we see God show Nineveh grace. And today, I think God wants to show you and me grace. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, it says he had compassion on them. Again, your circumstances might not change, but when you cry out to God, he'll have compassion on you. 
His heart goes out to you. He sees you in your pain. He sees you in your brokenness. He's with you. God gave them a second chance, and I think God is coming here today to give some of us a second chance. If we repent and we turn to him, I think he could do far more than we could ever imagine. So I want you to think of something that you might be holding on to. Something you're holding on to that you maybe need to let go of so that God can do what he wants to do in your life. Maybe you're holding on to some sin or holding on to some relationship that that you know it's not of God or maybe what others think about you. Maybe you're, maybe you're holding on to, to something that in your eyes is actually, it seems or appears to be good, but when you really get to the heart of it, it really shows your brokenness. Maybe there's something you really need to repent of. You need to leave it behind so that you can pursue God full speed. I want to obey him. I want to surrender my life again. I've got unfinished business. I want to do what God wants me to do. I want another chance. I want to be his. I want to make a difference. I want to know him in a more intimate and powerful way. I want to let go of everything. Everything that might be keeping me from going on. Maybe others of you, you may realize that God's coming to you again. He's the God of second chances. Maybe in your past you felt drawn to God, but you've just been kind of doing your own thing. I know I've been there so many times in my life. Maybe you just need to say yes again. Give God another chance. He's coming to you that shiny, a second time. Maybe there's this very real thing that's going on. Maybe the Spirit is maybe drawing you in, giving you that second chance today. And you have a choice, just like the, the Ninevites. You can be destroyed or you can be radically changed. What is it going to be? Maybe you felt like you've rejected him too much, you've dishonored him too much. I, again, I know so many times in my life I've felt that way. I've felt that my life's too broken, that I'm, that I'm too messed up, that the things I've done have disqualified me from receiving God's grace today. I'm too untrustworthy. I don't deserve his love. And the times in my life when I've felt like that, it's been moments like this, like today, or it's been a conversation with a friend or, or a moment on my knees in which God has shown up and I've realized that he loves me even though I don't deserve it. That he's still extending his hand to me even when it doesn't make sense. Scripture says that anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Anyone. Anyone. Doesn't matter how bad you've been. Doesn't matter how dark your world is. It doesn't matter how far you felt from God in the past. Anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And there's a new beginning. I love the language that scripture uses. It says that the old has gone and the new has come. You need a new beginning to be made brand new. And the cool thing happens because we're filled with the spirit of God. We're able to to cry out. He's able to hear from us. And the spirit of God is leading us and guiding us and directing us. And we can feel that spirit. We're in tune with that spirit. We can sense where the spirit's leading us day to day. We're convicted of sin when we know it's wrong. We're encouraged to talk to people maybe we would never talk to before. We're able to treat people with love and grace even though they don't deserve it. We're able to mend broken relationships. We're able to be really generous because the Spirit of God is active and moving and we're obedient to it. That's what can happen when we surrender, not just part of our life, but all of it. Not just a little piece, not just on Sunday, but every day. When we surrender our lives to God, And we realize that he's given us these gifts and these passions and desires to be used by him. That you're not too far gone. God can use you exactly how you are. You have gifts to this world that you maybe never have dreamed that you could use, that people need. 
wherever you might be, I just pray that you're able to respond today. Respond to his grace. And my hope for us is that we'll be able to worship the God today of second chances. Worship the God of Shani. The God who comes to us again. Father, I'm believing today that there's maybe some people in the room that feel just that. That they're not worthy of a second chance. That they're not worthy of being trusted. They're not worthy of being loved. But God, I love that we read in the story of Jonah that you showed Jonah grace at the beginning. You showed the Ninevites grace at the end. And you want to come to this place today and show us grace. Give us the same thing, the love that we don't deserve. But the hardest thing, one of the hardest things to do in the world is to accept the gift of grace. Because our hearts have been deceived. Our hearts have become like stone. Our, our hearts have become hardened. And we have to lay down our pride. Lay down our brokenness. Lay down our sin. And just accept it. Just feel it. Just be washed up in it. God, would you break the hearts of stone today? Would you allow us to worship you maybe like never before because you're the God of second chances. You're the God that's meeting us here again. You're the God that shows up over and over again even when we don't deserve it. You continue to show us grace. So God, allow us to let go of some things. May your spirit convict us of, of some obstacles, some things that maybe we need to let go of so that we can really go and do what you want us to do. Following in this example of Jonah, untie it, loosen it, let it go today so that we can chase after you. Pray this in Jesus' name.